What's going on, everybody? It's your host, DadBot, here, and welcome to my Bloodborne walkthrough. Now, the reason I am doing this walkthrough is because I myself was very skeptical of this game for a long time, and I wondered if I would even enjoy playing it. In fact, I never really even played this game until about a year ago in August of 2018. But through that year, and many, many playthroughs later, I went from being a Bloodborne skeptic to this game easily being one of my top five favorite games of all time. So one of the things that I want to accomplish with this walkthrough is to help people see Bloodborne for what it really is, and maybe debunk some of those perceived barriers to entry for those who have been curious about the game, but for one reason or another have yet to take the plunge. In fact, if I could convince one person who has been wondering about this game to go on and uh, dive in and experience this game, I would consider this walkthrough a success. So other than that, some of my goals of this walkthrough are to explain the game's mechanics in detail and provide a path through the game that could easily be followed by someone who's never played it before. Uh, during the walkthrough, we're going to explore every area, we're going to beat every boss, and that includes the DLC. We're going to get the vast majority of items and loot. We're going to dive into the different NPC quest lines and explain nuggets of the game's lore along the way. And we're going to do this all as efficiently as possible. My goal is for this entire walkthrough to be about 25 or so hours long, and yet still give you the most comprehensive experience through the game as possible. So, with all that being said, let's get into it. Oh, yeah. Pale. <laughs> well, you've come to the right place. Yarnum is the home of blood administration. You need only unravel its mystery. But where's an outsider like yourself to begin? Easy, with a bit of Yarnum blood of your own. But first, you'll need a contract. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do here is uh, create our character. Um, this tool here that we're gonna be using to make our character is actually pretty detailed and involved. Um, you could easily spend over an hour doing this if you wanted to. Obviously, I'm not gonna do that. I don't wanna waste a whole bunch of time with this, so I'm, I'm gonna stick mainly to the default uh, setup here. Um, the one thing that really does uh, make a big difference here with the character creation is your origin. And this dictates what your starting levels are going to be. So there are these different backgrounds that you can select your character to be from, from milk toast to lone survivor, military veteran to waste of skin, which is actually the lowest level you can start the game at if you just want to make the game harder for yourself. Um, so what this means is you know you can set up a certain build for your character and this kind of gives you the starting stats that uh, you can launch that build from I tend to favor more strength skill vitality and endurance um, some people like to do more of a blood tinge build which blood tinge is um, more or less towards the beginning of the game focused on your firearms that you're going to be using and then also there are some melee weapons later in the game that at scale based on blood tinge and same goes for arcane um, arcane is essentially magic this game doesn't have magic per se in the traditional sense but what it does have is certain items that you can't use unless you have certain arcane and, and certain abilities that you can't use unless you have a certain level of arcane and then also much like blood tinge there are some melee weapons that scale off arcane as well um, in terms of uh, starting off with stats that give you some more instant gratification, um, starting off with skill and strength is probably the way to go. I typically start off with military veteran just because it's, it gives me a balanced character. Um, it doesn't really uh, start off with high blood tinge or arcane, but it does start off with some decent skill and strength, so that's what I'm going to choose. You can choose whatever you want, whatever you feel like you're going to want to do through the game, but if you're going to follow my character, it'd be a good idea to start with this military veteran as well. I'm not really going to do much with my appearance or anything else like that, um, but just to give you a flavor, you can change your uh, gender, age, your voice, kind of your build if you're going to be um, burly or small or slim. Uh, you can give yourself different skin colors, face details, you can give yourself beards, glasses, all sorts of stuff, um, but I'm not going to, to really get into all that uh, just for the sake of time. So let's go ahead and move on with the game here.
Good, good. All signed and sealed. Now, let's begin the transfusion. Oh, don't you worry. Whatever happens, you may think it all a mere bad dream. You found yourself a hunter. All right. So that was the opening cutscene. And as you can see, we're waking up here in some sort of clinic where a blood transfusion was just performed on us. If you're anything like me, you're probably wondering what on earth just happened and what is going on. Um, that is actually a very good question to ask. Um, this game is very mysterious and cryptic with how it delivers um, the narrative and kind of the overall plot and theme of the game. It's not like a traditional game where you would expect to see, you know, AAA level cutscenes and voice acting and set pieces, but rather this game is delivers its uh, story more kind of like an onion. As you go through the game, um, you're going to uncover certain things, pick up certain items, and meet certain characters along the way. They're just going to give you little tidbits, bit by bit, and uh, the story kind of unfolds in layers if you think about it kind of like an onion. Um, the creator of the game, Hidetaki Miyazaki, once said that he doesn't tell stories, but rather he instead prefers to tell worlds. And I think that's about as accurate of a description of this game as you're going to get. Um, the world itself is even like an onion. I mean, we start at a certain place, but then you'll see just kind of you peel back layers as you go through the game, and then it, you just see a, a more and more of, of the, the, the character of this game as you go forward. It really is a masterpiece in that regard. Um, one way that this game does tell the story, and one thing I'm going to emphasize uh, throughout the playthrough is this game reveals a little bit about itself and its story through the items and the gear that you pick up. So we're going to start with that. We're going to open up our menu, get the options button, it pulls up your menu. And you'll notice when you pull up the menu, you can still move around. Um, there's actually no true way to pause this game. So when you pull up your menu, everything is still going on. If you're surrounded by enemies and you pull up the menu, they're still going to attack you. And you can still even run around while that's all happening. Um, <clears throat> So the main top row, you see you have your inventory, your stats, and then your configuration as well. Um, so in your inventory, you know, you have your basic items. You'll have your, when you get weapons, we'll have weapons up here. And then we have our equipment, um, our, our basically our, uh, our, uh, our gear that we're wearing, um, our armor, if you want to call it that. Um, so we'll start with the hunter's mark. That's the only thing that we have for starters. And that says it's a dangling upside down rune etched in one's mind, a symbol of a hunter. By focusing one's thoughts on this rune, a hunter loses all blood echoes but awakens afresh as if it were all just a bad dream. So this is what defines us as what this game calls a hunter. And hunters, to put it simply, uh, hunt beasts. And we'll see more about that in just a little bit. 
If you use this item, what it does is it returns you to the latest checkpoint that you've activated, but you lose all of your blood echoes. What blood echoes are, you'll see at the top right of the corner, we have 320 of them, and that's because of the uh, that's because of the character's, I guess, background that we selected when we did the character creation. We selected military veteran, and military veterans start with 320 blood echoes. So blood echoes double as both our experience points and our currency in this game, or the primary form of currency, I should say. <clears throat> and so when you use this, you respawn at the latest checkpoint, but you lose all your blood echoes. I've honestly never used this item before. It's kind of a waste if you lose all your blood echoes when you use it, especially since pretty soon we're going to get an item that does the same exact thing, but lets us keep all of our blood echoes, although it is a consumable with a finite use. This one is infinite use. If we look over at our garb, um, what, what you can do is you can select any item, whether it be a just a consumable, whether it be a key, a weapon, or um, your attire. If you press the square button, it pulls up this description that I was looking at before. And so this is a good way if you want to try to put some of the pieces of the puzzle together yourself to sort of get into that. So um, so here we have, uh, let's look at our foreign garb. So we're a foreigner. We came from a faraway place. It says clothing worn upon awakening to the nightmare of blood and beasts. Not typical clothing for Yarnum, which is the city we're in now, but perhaps it is of foreign origin. It is said, after all, the traveler came to Yarnum from afar. Without memory, who will ever know? So essentially it starts off, we know about as much as our character does. Apparently in this whole process, we've lost our memory. Um, kind of rumor has it that we made this trek from a faraway place to Yarnum because we had we were beset by some physical ailment. And so we wanted to come to Yarnum, Yarnum to uh, receive blood treatment because the Yarnum blood has special mysterious properties that heal people from their diseases. So perhaps that's why we came all this way over here. And now we're marked as a hunter of beasts. So as as, uh, as we get acquainted with the controls here, I mean, movement is pretty standard. Camera control is pretty standard. Left joystick and right joystick is how we're going to do this. Um, you'll see that we have this little piece of paper that has a little glow on the corner of it. This is what uh, is generally called a lore note. You'll see these scattered across the world, and generally they'll give you just a little tidbit of that lore and help you. It's a, it's a, think of it as a puzzle piece, and we'll use these to put some of the pieces of the puzzle together. So this says, handwritten scrawl, seek pale blood to transcend the hunt. So so that's our mission. We're seeking pale blood, and we want to transcend the hunt. Um, whatever that means, it doesn't mean a whole lot to us yet, but hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense as we go. So as we explore, we'll see we have a door here. This door is locked. We cannot open it. That is very common in this game to come across a door that you can't open. Usually they're locked from the other side. You have to find a way around to get to it before you can, can open them up. Oftentimes those doors will function as shortcuts later in the game. Um, so we have this door, and at this point in the game, this is really the only place you can go. You really can't get lost in this area. So you just go through this door, head down the stairwell, and then we arrive in a bigger room uh, where uh, we'll see we have more tables, and yeah, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so here we have these little notes on the floor. Um, it's a, kind of a little, it looks sort of like a puddle um, and these little guys come up here these are called messengers so you can view these notes and at this point in the game what these notes are functioning as is just kind of acquainting you with the basic controls of the game so this one says r1 is your is your attack your standard attack with your right hand weapon and this one's telling us that use the r3 button to lock on so locking on is a very essential mechanic of this game um, it's going to be very difficult if you don't use it i lock on to probably I would say maybe even 90% of enemies in this game. Sometimes I get lazy and don't lock on, and sometimes that costs me. Um, there are some bosses that I prefer not to lock on to just because it's easier to hit their weak spot if you're not locked on to, but in general, it's a good practice to lock on. Um, and so this other one said R1 is our attack. You'll notice we don't have a weapon. We just have our bare hands right now, and that's probably not going to bode well for us at this point in the game, but we'll see. So anyways, it's a good idea just to acquaint yourself with movement. Maybe uh, if you press the circle button, you can dodge, and if you dodge in basically the uh, direction that you're pointing to with the left analog stick. So maybe just uh, get, a, get acquainted with some of these controls. R1 is your primary attack. R2 is your, quote, strong attack. And then you can even hold R2 down to get a charge attack. So if you hold R2 down and you see that little shiny 
glint before you punch. Um, that means you're doing a charge attack. Now it does more damage, but it's a little bit slower than your R1 quick attack, and so you just have to consider the cost benefit between the damage you're dealing with one hit versus the timing that it takes to execute the hit properly. So with that said, let's move forward. So now we're in this larger area. We see lots of, of tables and kind of IVs set up for blood transfusion. And lo and behold, we have our first beast. We're far enough back to where he doesn't notice us. Obviously, he's uh, enjoying a meal. Um, and the truth is, is there's nowhere else to go except right to where he is. And of course, once we get close enough, he is going to to notice us. I like to say that this game throws you right to the wolves and that comes figuratively and literally. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to try to demonstrate some of the mechanics of this game while I get his attention. Um, I'm probably not going to last very long. It is possible to beat him with your bare hands. It is very difficult, so you're probably not going to happen on your first playthrough. Um, but I am going to die to him because that is basically what the game is designed to happen. You're supposed to die to this person. You're not bad at the game if you die to him. It is actually exactly what's supposed to happen to you. So without further ado, let's engage this enemy. So you can see I just locked onto him. I just pressed the R3 button and you can tell that I locked onto him because you can see that shiny dot in the middle. So that means that all of my actions are gonna revolve around that shiny dot. Um, so let's approach him and get his attention. So he's gonna attack you right away. This is a good opportunity to maybe learn how to dodge. Just see how the mechanics work in the heat of combat. You'll notice that I dodged right through his attack there. If you dodge and you time your dodges correctly, you're going to get invincibility frames. Um, so even though it looks like you maybe should take damage, you're not because of those invincibility frames. Um, so that's a really good uh, use of your dodges and, you know, it's a core mechanic of the game, really. Um, so, so learning how to dodge is, is, is a good thing to, to practice early on. So now we're going to actually run away from him. We're going to keep his attention, and I'm going to go through this door. Um, he's going to come up. You'll notice when I'm opening this door, again, I have invincibility frames or iframes. He can't attack you, or no enemy can attack you while you're opening a door. That's just one of the things about this game. So I'm going to let him kill me right here and show you what's supposed to happen. All right, that was fun. So where we're going to go next is the Hunter's Dream. Um, we're automatically going to warp there because we just died. And um, the Hunter's Dream functions as the central hub of this game. And so you'll see we're on the ground. Uh, this little cutscene is just a, a, a small introduction to the Hunter's Dream. We get to enjoy this soothing music while we're at it. So here we are. So this is the Hunter's Dream. It's it's not a very large area, but literally, um, you know, everything we do to enhance our character pretty much is done in the Hunter's Dream. We level up in the Hunter's Dream. We shop for items and weapons and attire in the Hunter's Dream. We shop for, uh, you know, buffs to our weapons. Um, we can upgrade our weapons with upgrade materials. We can access the item box. Um, there's all sorts of things we can do in the Hunter's Dream, and so we'll get into all of that um, kind of as the gameplay dictates. So as you go around to this backside of the Hunter's Dream, you'll see that we have more of these puddles with the messengers popping up. These messengers are really just explaining some of the core basic mechanics of the game. Um, I'm not going to you know, sit at each of one of these and read them just because as the gameplay goes along, I'm going to explain each one of these in detail and give examples along the way at, at, in the middle of combat and just how these things work in a practical sense the context of the game so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time reading all these because I'm going to explain them in detail later. You'll see we have this gate to a graveyard. Um, it's closed, it's locked for now, um, but it's going to play a role a bit later. <clears throat> and so here we have more notes, more tips, and I want to switch weapons, use items, etc. I'm going to get into all that in a pretty great level of detail here in a little bit. Um, so elsewhere in the Hunter's Dream, over here, we have this, which is the item shop. Um, this, 
In this shop, we can spend our blood echoes. I mentioned that blood echoes double as currency and experience points, so we can spend our blood echoes to buy items. Right now, we don't have very much for sale, um, but that's okay. Uh, it's really a limited selection to begin the game with, but as we go through the game, there will be more and more um, items for sale at the at the uh, shop, and we're going to frequent it you know, every once in a while just to uh, get what we need to get to get through the game. All right, so finally, the game decides it's time to have a weapon. So the messengers offer you a trick weapon. Choose one. Trick weapons are wielded in the right hand and employed in beast hunting. So for starters, we can pick one of three weapons. I generally favor the saw cleaver. It has a pretty quick attack. It's easy to chain, and it also deals a solid amount of damage. I actually use this all throughout the game. There are certain bosses that this weapon just works really well on and I do recommend it for beginners. I consider it pretty much the quintessential weapon of this game. I mean, if you look at the you know, art in the uh, title screen, it's a hunter holding a saw cleaver and that really just embodies this game in my opinion. So the saw cleaver item description says, one of the trick weapons of the workshop commonly used in the hunting business. This saw, effective at drawing the blood of beasts, transforms into a long cleaver that makes use of centrifugal force. The saw, with its set of bloodletting teeth, has become a symbol of the hunt and only grows in effectiveness the more grotesquely transformed the beast. So the, one of the reasons why I like the saw cleaver is, is because it is a what they call a serrated weapon, and it is very good against beasts. The first boss that we're going to fight in this game is a beast, and the saw cleaver is very effective at staggering um, the boss, just because of the fact that it is a serrated weapon. You really can't go wrong with the hunter's axe either. Um, the hunter's axe is a very good weapon. It's very powerful. It has very strong attacks. Um, I can't really speak much to the threaded cane. I don't really use it all that much. It is the weakest of the three, but you can transform it into a whip, and it perhaps has the best range of the three um, as just a just an everyday use kind of uh, weapon. But of course, as I said before, I do uh, prefer the sock lever, so I'd recommend starting with that. Some things I'll point out were on the screen. Um, you'll see in that middle column it has just the, the, the statistics, the physical attack. Um, you know, it has we do 90 attack plus 8. That plus 8 is the bonus that we have due to scaling. So if you look towards the bottom of that center column, you will see that uh, that that little line that says attribute bonus. So the D means that this scales to our strength attribute, and the E means that it scales to our uh, dexterity or skill. I think it's called in this game attribute. So the so the higher up in the alphabet, or I should say the lower in the alphabet, the letter, the better the scaling. So if you have an A scaling, that's that's really good, whereas an E scaling is about the worst that it can possibly scale. At least it does scale, but it's just not very strong scaling. So a D and an E is a starting weapon. I mean, we can't really ask for much more, but later in the game, we're probably going to get some weapons that scale a lot better to our stats, and so therefore we're going to get a better stat bonus when we use them. All right, so all that being said, um, Let's pick up the saw cleaver. And then up here, we get our left-handed weapon. The messengers offer you a firearm. Choose one. Firearms are wielded with the left hand and employed in beast hunting. So this is going to be the weapon that we hold in our left hand. So we have two weapons on us. We have one in our right hand, which is going to be our saw cleaver, and we have one in our left hand, which is going to be our gun. You can choose between the hunter's pistol, the hunter's pistol, and the hunter blunderbuss. Um, I generally recommend the pistol, just because my primary use for firearms in this game is to execute parries and then visceral attacks. Um, the pistol is better in terms of timing. There's a little bit of a delay in the blunderbuss, which functions more of a shot more like a shotgun um, and so it's easier to execute that parry timing with the pistol so I do recommend that for beginners especially but even as an experienced player I do like the pistol more just because it is easier to execute those parries and I do use that frequently especially in the beginning of the game it's a pretty critical uh, piece of my uh, st my strategy in combat all right so let's pick up the hunter's pistol all right and up here, we have the uh, notebook. And the notebook is an uh, online only item. Um, so we're playing, I'm playing this walkthrough. I'm doing it all offline. I want to do everything single player. I want to handle all of the bosses and all of the areas um, solo without help. So I'm playing offline. However, if you are playing online, you can use the notebook. Messengers are inhabitants of the dream who revere the brave hunters. Use this. Use them to send messages to other worlds. Leave notes with messengers. Read the notes 
left to messengers in other worlds and rate notes to reach out to hunters across planes of existence. Um, so what you can do is you remember those little puddles on the ground where the messengers are popping up and giving us hints and whatnot. Well, you can actually, uh, with, the, with the notebook, you can create custom hints to leave to other players. And again, it's an online only weapon. So, you know, once if you're connected online to, you know, other players, you can see some of the notes that they leave and then they can see some of the notes that, that uh, you can see the notes they leave and, and they can see the notes that you leave. Um, so some people just try to troll you. They'll tell you, you know, jump off this ledge for a secret and you jump off and really you just die. But some of them are actually pretty helpful. Like some of them will warn you of a trap that's ahead or something like that. So you can take them with a grain of salt, um, but we're not going to see them since we're playing offline again. Um, so if we go all the way up here, we'll notice that this door is closed. This is the door to the workshop um, and we can't get there quite yet, but we're going to get there next time we come back to the Hunter's Dream. So you'll see that we have these headstones that go down these stairways. These headstones are how we warp to the various checkpoints that we've activated throughout the game. At this point, we only have an option to warp to one location, but as we go through the game, we'll have these different um, headstones activated where we can warp to the various checkpoints that we've activated throughout the game. So we're going to go back to the first floor sick room, which is where we just were. You may have noticed just then that those loading screens have uh, some of the item descriptions on them. So if you're not reading them as you pick them up, which, you know, depending on how deep into the lore you want to go, you may or may not want to read all these item descriptions. I'm going to read some of them throughout the playthrough, but not all. Um, but, you know, as during those loading screens, they conveniently put some of those item descriptions up for you so you can read them while your game's loading. All right. So first things first, we want to equip our weapons. So the second row in our menu is how we do that. These first two slots are for our right-handed weapon. These second two slots are for your left-handed weapon. So we can equip two of each. We only have one of each right now. But uh, if you have two equipped, either two right-handed or two left-handed or both equipped, um, you can cycle through with the D-pad on which one you actually have equipped. So here we go. We have our saw cleaver in our right hand and we have our gun in our left hand. Um, so as I said before, you know, your R1 attack is going to be kind of your bread and butter. It's your primary attack. Um, your R2 attack is considered a strong attack, and then you can hold R2 down for your charge attack. That's going to be your most powerful attack that you have in your arsenal, generally. Um, you can, if you press up, on the left stick and R2 at the same time, you'll perform a jump attack, which gives you a little bit more range. Um, also, if you run forward and if you use R1 while you're running, you'll perform a running attack, which is good to use if you're sneaking up on an enemy and they don't know that you're there. You kind of get a, a powerful preemptive slice on them and it works very well in certain situations. Um, you'll notice that when we picked up this weapon in the Hunter's Dream, they called it a trick weapon. All of the weapons in this game are considered, all the right-handed weapons, I should say, in this game are considered trick weapons. What that means is that they have two forms. You can transform your weapon um, into its alternative form by simply hitting the L1 button. So right now it's in its compact form. If you hit L1, you uh, you transform it to its extended range. So the, ex the extended range form. Um, so while it does have some extended range, it, it is a longer weapon, and it does take longer to attack. The attack animation is slightly longer, so you know keep that in mind um, when using it like that. You will get the extra range, but it comes at the cost of quickness. So here, you know, we can slice real quick, and we can get a lot of hits in very quickly. Whereas when it's transformed, it takes a little bit longer to to chain your attacks together. Um, Another cool feature is you can actually use the, tra the weapon transformation as an attack. Um, and what you do is to do that is you have to transform your weapon in the midst of a combo, essentially. So let's say if you hit R1 and then immediately after hit L1, you're going to perform a transform attack. Um, and you can actually tra chain transform attacks together as well. So, for example, you can hit R1, L1, L1, and it'll look like this. So transform attacks, I believe they do a little bit more damage than your standard attacks. However, they will cost more stamina. You'll notice that green bar we have at the top left, that represents our stamina. So anytime you're sprinting using the circle button, anytime you dodge, anytime you attack, it's going to drain your stamina. And you notice that your stamina regens pretty quickly by itself all the way back to full. But if you're in the heat of battle and you run out of stamina, uh, you might leave yourself open to an attack if you can't keep uh, if you can't keep moving. And uh, so it is very important to kind of keep an eye on that stamina, especially when you're in the heat of battle and make sure that you're managing it properly. And of course, the red bar on top of that's going to be our health. Um, so enough of my yapping. Let's go kill ourselves a beast. 
So now it's time for payback. We are prepared and we are equipped. So let's do what we did before. Let's walk up. Let's lock on and let's uh, put an end to this little feast that he's having. I mentioned before, a running attack is a good way to kind of surprise an enemy. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to run up to him, perform a running attack by pressing R1 while running. And then we're just going to kind of mash R1 until he's dead. He's going to die quickly. He's not as strong as an enemy as you'd think once you're equipped with an actual weapon. So let's do it. Just like that. Nothing to it. So you can see that little glow that's coming out of his corpse there. That means that he dropped an item for us to pick up. So we pick it up and we get three blood vials. So now you'll see that little icon at the top has a three next to it. That icon represents the number of blood vials that we have in our inventory. And blood vials are used as our recovery item to heal our health. You use a blood vial by pressing the triangle button, and the triangle button is basically your healing button in this game. It's not mapped to any other activity, so you only press triangle when you want to heal. Over here, we have another item, and this is just on a corpse. It's not because we killed anybody. Sometimes when you're exploring the environment, you'll see the little glow. You'll know that there's an item for you to pick up. So in this case, we get two more blood vials, so we have a total of five. So you might be wondering what that little icon below our blood vial icon is. It has a 10 next to it. And that is our Quicksilver Bullets. So our Quicksilver Bullets, those uh, functions as our ammunition for, um, for our, our firearm. And so you press R2, you fire a Quicksilver Bullet. Um, and it's pretty much as simple as that at this point in the game. Uh, one other feature that's unique is if you press up on the D-pad, you can give yourself what you what is called blood bullets. And so let's say if you're in a pinch, you're fighting an enemy, you ran out of quick server bullets, and you really need some more to continue on in the fight and win, you can press up and you'll give yourself, you'll see that red plus five, you'll give yourself five extra quicksilver bullets just by pressing up. They're called blood bullets. Now however, they're called blood bullets, so that means that they come at the expense of your health. So you see at the top, we've actually expended a little bit of our health just to give ourselves those five bullets. So when I'm in a pinch and I need some extra bullets, I will employ that strategy, but then what I'll do is I'll press triangle and pretty much immediately heal back to full health automatically. Um, I, I don't like you know, fighting with less health than I would like to have just because I gave myself some extra bullets. So pretty much if I ever give myself extra bullets, I'm going to immediately heal afterwards. So this here is our blood stain. And this occurs because we died to that beast back there. Um, so this game has a mechanic to where if you die, you lose all of your blood echoes. Your blood echoes go to zero. However, if you can reach back to the point to where you died before you die again, you have the opportunity to reclaim the blood echoes that you lost. So let's go over to our blood, our blood stain, hit X, and we're going to get back our lost blood echoes from, from when we lost to that wolf beast before. So now we have them all back. Now the catch is, if you die on the way back to your blood stain, your blood echoes are gone forever. So there might be cases where you have 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 blood echoes at stake. If you die, you gotta make it back to that blood stain because if you die on your way back, those 50,000 blood echoes are gone and you're starting from ground zero again. So it can be very stressful um, to, to, to do that, to have to get back to your blood echoes. It's going to happen. It will happen. And uh, it's just one of those things about this game that you have to embrace, but it makes it a challenge and it makes it thrilling, to be quite honest, uh, when we have a lot on the line. So here we have another uh, item here. We search the body, we get 10 more Quicksilver bullets. So we're sitting pretty good on those Quicksilver bullets right now. You'll see back here we have a gate, as you could guess. It's locked from the other side. We can't open it. However, this gate, we can open. All right. Before we proceed, we're gonna hop down here. We got some more blood vials on this corpse. So now we're up to eight blood vials, which is a pretty good stash to start the game with. Now around the corner here, we're going to find our first enemy. Um, he, is dragging an axe on the ground, which is what's making that noise. And so let's fight him. Generally, it's a good idea. You can just kind of bait their attacks. If you're fighting one-on-one, -on -one, you can dodge backwards once you see them start to swing, and then you run in and just attack them. This guy's gonna take three hits for us to kill. Um, if he hits you, 
I mean, he'll do a, a decent amount of damage, but it's by no means going to be a one-shot. Um, the big risk at this part of the game is being ganged up by a swarm of enemies, and that can and will happen if you're not careful. So over here we have another corpse. Has some more blood vials for us. And over here we can see two guys laying on the ground. They are not dead. They're going to get up as soon as we go near them. And we can kind of tell because the game lets us lock on to them. So we know that they're actual enemies. So one thing I'm going to show is I'm going to kill this guy right in front of us that I'm currently locked on to. I'm going to let this other guy hit us. And that's going to be to display another one of the game's core mechanics, which is often referred to as the rally system or the rally mechanic. Um, and so what's going to happen is I'm going to let him hit me. And you'll notice that my health bar at the top, my red health bar, is actually going to turn a, a, a sliver of it. The, basically, the amount of damage that he dealt to me is going to turn orange. And what that orange sliver means is if I... Uh, am aggressive, and if I attack him back, if I counterattack him immediately, I can regain that orange portion of my health simply just by being aggressive and attacking him back. So, in in essence, it's it's you're, you're you're able to recover some of your health if you play aggressive, if you fight aggressively, you can recover some of your health without even using blood vials. So the game kind of rewards that style of combat, and that's one of my favorite features of this game, actually. So let's kill this guy, and I'm going to show you the rally mechanic with the other guy. See, now they're getting up. Not going to last long. All right, so this guy, I'm going to let him hit me. Look at that. He's got a little hook. All right, come on. All right, so I got that orange. I'm going to run back and attack him. I got it all back. Look at that. I'm at full health. Even though I got hit, I'm still at full health. That is an awesome mechanic of this game. I really enjoy it. It makes combat really fun and rewarding. Um, and so I, I highly recommend adopting somewhat of an aggressive play style. Don't be reckless. Don't rush into a bunch of enemies. That'll get you killed. But if you're fighting one-on-one, -on -one, especially it can be helpful with bosses too. Um, the game really does reward, uh, reward you for kind of manning up and going in there and getting it done. So here we have uh, some more loot, and this is six Molotov cocktails. So Molotov cocktails are a consumable. So we go here, our menu. Um, it's, you know, what you think it'd be. You just throw it and it explodes, so it's a long-range weapon. So um, our weapons we're gonna, going to equip down here. This is kind of our quick select weapon, or a quick select item toolbar. Um, so if you go here, we can equip our Molotov cocktails, and you'll see that we have Molotov cocktails equipped in that little square in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. Um, so you use weapons by hitting the square button. So if we were to hit the square button, we would use one Molotov cocktail. And, um, you know, so whatever weapon you currently have equipped in that square up there is a weapon that you're going to use when you hit square. So now we have to pull this lever, and we're going to get a ladder. And here we go. We're going to climb the ladder. You can also hit circle to climb the, to ascend a ladder quicker. And it doesn't e even cost stamina, so it's a good idea to do if you're just not wanting to climb the ladder forever. So that big scream we heard was the Cleric Beast. And that is the first boss we're going to be fighting in this game. And we fight him right there on that bridge right in front of us. And one of the things that I really enjoy about this game in terms of how the, the levels are designed is pretty much anything you can see off in the distance. Anything you can see, that's generally going to be a place where you're eventually going to go. Um, really, not, whole, not a whole lot is here just for show. Um, you know, the levels are designed such that everything is interconnected, and, you know, we can see that uh, area, I don't know if I can pan the camera there, we can see that area back there, that's a cathedral ward, and that's kind of the second main area of the game after we get through central Yarnum. Um, so all really cool. Once you see something, you wonder what it is, eventually you're going to get there. So here we have our first uh, lantern. Um, so you can light this lantern, and lanterns in this game function as our checkpoints. Um, <clears throat> so when you get to a lantern, if you die, you're going to automatically respawn at this lantern. Um, also, you can use this lantern or any lantern to uh, return to the hunter's dream. And let's say you have a bunch of blood echoes, you want to level up, if you want to upgrade your weapons, you know, buy some items or you know buy new attire or weapons or whatever you know we can always work back to the hunter's dream by going to one of these lanterns um, so here we're going to talk to our first npc um, this is going to be gilbert and you'll notice that in front of his window he's got this little lamp that's burning this orangish incense so anytime you see this incense that means that there's an npc inside that you can talk to so let's go ahead and talk to him and see what he has to say oh you must be a hunter and not one from around here either. I'm Gilbert, 
A fellow outsider. You must have had a fine time of it. Yarnum has a special way of treating guests. Well, I don't think I could stand if I wanted to, but I'm willing to help if there's anything that can be done. <laughs> this time is cursed. Whatever your reasons might be, you should plan a swift exit. Whatever can be gained from this place, it will do more harm than good. All right, this town is cursed. You had it notice. Nobody here really likes us around. Pale blood, you say? Hmm. Never heard of it. But if it's blood you're interested in, you should try the healing church. The church controls all knowledge on blood ministration and all varieties of blood. Across the valley to the east of Yarnum lies the town of the healing church, known as the Cathedral Ward. And deep within Cathedral Ward is the old Grand Cathedral. The birthplace of the healing church, special blood, or so they say. <laughs> Yarnamites don't share much with outsiders. Normally they wouldn't let you near the place, but the hunt is on tonight. This might be your chance. All right, so he made reference to the Healing Church, and the Healing Church is the organization in this game responsible for the blood that has the mysterious healing properties that are highly sought after. Um, there might be more to this blood, and we'll get to it uh, as we dive deeper into this game. And as you said, the home of the Healing Church is in Cathedral, is in cathedral Ward, which is where we're going to head next after we finish with this level. Let's see if he has anything else to say. To the east of Yarnum, you'll find the Cathedral Ward. Deep within lies the old main cathedral. I haven't heard of pale blood, but that's your best bet if it's anything to do with unique types of blood. <laughs> Alright. Well, he doesn't seem to be in good shape. He's got a nasty sounding cough. Um, Alright. So here we have a gate. Shocker. Does not open from this side. This gate is going to function as a massive shortcut that we're going to unlock earlier or unlock later on in our playthrough and um, it's going to save us a lot of time. It takes a while to get to and you have to fight your way through some enemies to get there but it is uh, a, a nice little reward once we do get there. And that's kind of one of the, the core markers of progress in this game are the shortcuts because you work through a level for half an hour, you get to a shortcut, automatically you can skip that half hour if you die and uh, you need to get back to where you were, you can get there a lot quicker. So here we have pebbles. And uh, pebbles are a good item to have in your arsenal when it comes to uh, being able to lure enemies away from packs. So we're going to be using our pebbles quite a bit, especially early on, and uh, they're going to help us pretty greatly when it comes to working our way through herds of enemies. So now you can see we have two weapons equipped down, or two items equipped down here, um, and we, have, we can equip a max of six. So right now we only have two, but you can see if I press the down button, you can cycle between the two. As I mentioned before, you can only cycle through your items with the down button. If you press up, you're going to give yourself blood bullets. Um, I've made that mistake many times, and I'm surely will make that mistake uh, during this walkthrough as well. It's just kind of instinct. You think you can go cycle back if you skip over something by pressing up? Nope. You've got to cycle all the way back through by pressing down as many times as you need to. So let's move forward. So see back here, we got a guy. He's going to want to ambush us. He's going to break through this coffin, so be ready for that. We're going to make quick work of him, though. One shot. Pretty easy. So here you can drop down this little ledge. I don't recommend it because there's kind of a horde of enemies right there around the corner. So we're going to go back this way, and uh, we're going to find a better way through. Um, so now what I'm going to show you is the parry and visceral attack uh, move here. So how that works is you parry an enemy by shooting them with your gun in the middle of their attack animation. So you'll see them winding up for their attack and you hit R, if you hit L2 rather, if you hit L2 at just the right time to fire your gun, basically right before their attack hits you, 
it'll stagger them. You'll hear a little noise and they'll be staggered. And at that point, you can walk up to them. You have to literally be pressing up against them. And then if you press R1, instead of doing your normal R1 attack, you're going to perform a visceral attack, which does an absurd amount of damage. So let's demonstrate that right now. So this guy's going to get up. We'll do a visceral attack on him. All right, so come here. So right before his attack hits, when he's winding up... Whoops, missed that up. There we go. Uh, we'll... Oh, he didn't want to cooperate. He's a little bit harder to do it on because his attacks were so fast, but we'll find we'll find enemies later on where we can uh, where we can demonstrate the visceral attack a little bit uh, more cleanly. Um, all right, so let's make our way down here. So you'll see we have a pack of enemies kind of lined up to greet us here. Um, this is where our pebbles are going to come into handy. So let's run up behind this guy. Let's 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 get him with a pebble, and he'll come chase after us. Oh, this guy's around the corner too. All right, there we go. We got our visceral attack with this guy. You'll see that what the timing is is kind of right before his attack lands. Got him with this guy too. And then you walk up to him, right up against him, and press R1 to get a visceral attack. You'll see that one visceral attack did like 260 damage, which is much higher than our standard attack power uh, would allow for with our normal R1 attacks. So we'll, this is actually a really good place to, to try to practice that timing, even though you don't technically need it to kill these enemies, since they can you can kill them with your normal attacks fairly easily. There are enemies a bit later in this level where those visceral attacks are really going to come in handy. Um, so this is a really good uh, place in the game to, to work on getting that timing down. If you die, you don't really have all that much at stake right now in terms of blood echoes. Um, so let's lure this guy. Let's let's try to get a visceral on him. There we go. Kind of during that wind up, right before he hits you, that's your that's your golden opportunity to pull it off. Let's get one on this guy. You'll notice that guy couldn't hit us. Visceral attacks are another uh, point in the game where you have invincibility frames. If you're in the middle of your visceral attack, you cannot be hit by anybody. So. Opening doors, you have invincibility frames. If you time your rolls correctly, you have invincibility frames. If you're in the middle of a visceral attack, you have invincibility frames. So use those to your advantage. There we go, we got another one. So really, I would highly recommend practicing on these guys because even if they hit you, they're not gonna kill you um, if you're just fighting them one at a time. But learning that timing is gonna be so critical for later on in the game. And so as we get further down here. You know, I'm going to kill most of these guys normally. I might pull off a couple of viscerals just for show. Um, but as for learning the mechanics of this game, this is an excellent place to, to learn um, how to pull those off without much risk. So we have another NPC that we can talk to. And you that outsider? Well, sorry, but I don't want anything to do with you. Trot along, will ya? Alright. So Yarnamites, uh, they're not too fond of those who aren't from around here, but that's okay. We don't need them. Um, so what we're going to do next is we're going to go all the way down here, and we're going to pull this lever, which is going to unlock this gate right in front of us. Now, once we get through this gate, which we could not open from the other side, this area should look familiar. Aha! See, we've got some dudes laying around that we've already killed. So right over here, this is the clinic that we came out of, and this was the first area that we came when we pulled the ladder. So if we respawn um, at the clinic, you know, we can now get through to this area rather quickly since we just unlocked that shortcut. So now down here is an enemy, and if he looks strong to you, it's because he is much stronger than those enemies we were just facing. Now let's say you've, uh, you've done a few visceral attacks, you know, you're kind of feeling good about your parry timing and all that sort of thing. This can be the true test. You do not have to fight this enemy by any means. He is totally optional, but it might be a good benchmark just to kind of see where you're at. I'm going to go on and engage him, and I'll be honest with you, I don't always get the kill. Sometimes he ends up killing me, but we're at least going to try, and we're going to put our skills to use here and see if we can pull it off. Whoops. So... Make use of those dodges. Whoops, we got the got the parry. Got our visceral attack. He has enough health to where one visceral ain't gonna kill him, so you're gonna have to pull it off again. There we go. And he's dead. Just like that. 
you'll notice that he did some damage to us, but every time we did those viscerals, we got our rally damage back, so our orange health bar refilled once we did those viscerals. So we'll pick this up. He gives us blood vials. He also drops a uh, in some cases, we'll drop a blood gem. A blood gem is uh, an item that you can use to buff your weapons. We can't do that yet at this point in the game because we need to unlock something else before we can actually do that. But it could be useful if you get that pickup um, once you get to that point in the game where you can equip blood gems on your weapons. So, as I said, that was just for show. It might be a good test of your skills if you've practiced some of those visceral attacks on some of the weaker enemies. If you can kill that guy, you're sitting pretty good right now. And if you lose, you're just a hop, skip, a jumping away. You can just run right through that gate, and you're right back to where you were. So it's easy to get your blood echoes back. All right, let's carry on. We're going to top off our health, just in case. And uh, let's carry on. So right here, we have another NPC we can talk to. Last year, come on. You don't want to a night a hunt. I'll wait with you now all right yeah they don't like outsiders here that's okay all right so this guy don't be fooled he's laying on the ground he's gonna get up and kill you um, he's carrying a gun so he's gonna try to shoot you from far away um, and these guys instead of dropping blood vials the the people with the guns will drop quicksilver bullets instead so let's get our bullets three bullets not bad so let's we can go up here in this little stairwell um, let's let's proceed up here and ooh, shiny. There's an item, but beware of what lurks around the corner in ambush. Um, this game throws all kinds of stuff at you. It is not your friend. This game is not your friend. Everything in this game just about wants to kill you. So be on your guard at all times. Always be aware of your surroundings and always be expecting an ambush. So here we're picking up a bloodstone shard, and bloodstone shards uh, function as the materials that we're going to use to upgrade our weapons. Um, so we can upgrade our weapons to do more damage and things like that. Uh, so that, that is all done in the Hunter's Dream. Um, during this walkthrough, my goal is to kind of keep these videos between 30 minutes to an hour or so. I see we're already kind of getting to that 50-ish minute point. Um, this is probably about as good of a point as any to stop this section of the video. Um, in our next video, we're going to be heading over to that horde of enemies, and we're going to be working our way through there. Um, we're going to be using our pebbles, and we're going to uh, make them all wolf meat, and it will be great. I cannot wait. Uh, so be sure to tune in next time. Thank you so much for joining me in this walkthrough. If you like what you see, be sure to like this video and join the squad by subscribing to the channel. I'm always grateful for your support, and I cannot wait to see you in the next video. Have a great day.